Hi, with this video, I'm going to share with you a method that I have play tested for about five months, more or less. Five months, I think. I played it during different uh, moments between sessions with my group and with my uh, solo role playing. I've used it with different genres, systems, and this method will allow you to play any adventure module, any campaign as a solo experience. Maybe you purchased it or maybe you created your own adventure campaign. You're going to be playing as the game master and this method will give you what I would consider the most satisfying player character emulation that I have seen. This method um, came out as a sort of a product of inspiration after I reviewed the solitary GM. I'm going to put a link in the description below to that, um, that PDF, my review of that document. Because with the solitary GM, the author proposed a very interesting thing, player character emulation. I have already released a few videos covering solo and co-op role-playing games. I'm going to put the playlist in the description. I recommend the one where I talk about uh, solo role-playing games specifically, because in other videos I talk about other related topics, but there is a video there that focuses completely on solo RPGs. In that video I talked about how you could actually run some modules and campaigns uh, just by yourself, but uh, it's somewhat uh, lackluster or not as satisfying when you are running things as if you are a player character as a player and you're emulating the game master by using perhaps the mythic game master emulator. There are also some other systems. In fact, I think that we are seeing more and more of these systems as time goes by. That, that's amazing. When I was uh, much younger, I would have loved it if they had those systems because sometimes I wanted to play role-playing games by myself and other times my players told me oh we want you to participate with us like a player character there is there some way to do that and I wasn't uh, equipped to, to carry out that experience but with uh, there are so many tools that allow you to play as a player character uh, by your own or with someone else but this video specifically Abraham's method is going to teach you how to participate as a solo game master and with a party of uh, artificially artificial intelligence player characters that is those that are controlled by uh, different random elements that I will talk about in a few moments mm. you could also play with just one player character of course it all depends on the experience that you are looking for but the main point is that you're going to be playing all of those adventures, all of those campaigns, etc., that you purchased them and you wanted your players to participate um, in those adventures or, or campaigns and they weren't interested at all. I know a lot of you have had that experience where you have this adventure and you want to run this campaign or campaign setting, etc., but the players are not interested in that. Maybe they like fantasy games and they don't like sci-fi or maybe they like um, Wild West, but they don't like steampunk or uh, horror games so it, it all depends on the what the group as a whole is looking for as an experience in role-playing games so yes it's quite common that the game master accumulates so many adventures and, and campaigns and even entire uh, systems and some role-playing game systems cannot be played using well can only be played using a Game Master emulator with some difficulty because they have competitive elements to them. It's still possible, but it can get quite hectic and disorganized because there are some competitive role-playing games there uh, out there like uh, the made, made role-playing game, the Epoch horror game that is uh, played with cards. Mm. I haven't played one, one that is called Shinobi Gami but I also understand that it has a competitive side to it with hidden information and such. But with Abraham's method, I have played Ars Magica. I have used it with a uh, made role playing game just to see how you could participate as the master of, of the house and with those maids 
competing for your affection. So those uh, are AI or artificial intelligence controlled mates. I also played it with different versions of Dungeons and Dragons, different white box systems and astonishing swordsmen and sorcerers of Hyperborea, different variations, retro clones, pseudo clones. I also played it using the 2D20 system with uh, the Mutant Chronicles, uh, Savage Worlds as, as, uh, as well, but um, I, I was so surprised that it was actually so effective. It really feels like you are a game master and you have player characters uh, participating there. So it's going to be useful for any sort of genre. Okay, so what is this method about? The thing that we enjoy the most, at least in my opinion, when it comes to playing role-playing games with people, is that you are surprised, constantly surprised at the things that the player characters are doing. Sometimes they take on different puzzles, challenges in some really creative, sometimes absurd ways, and they actually work. Other times those uh, uh, solutions are quite silly, but it's always quite entertaining to see all of those um, ideas that the players come up with. But you cannot do that if you are using, for example, a mythic, a mythic game master emulator or, or some other type of, of system to um, have things working on automatic pilot. You have your uh, fictional or AI driven game master and you simply cannot get that sense of, of surprise or for fulfillment as the player characters come up with all of these crazy ideas. So for example, if you are a game master and you are trying to run an adventure module, one that you designed yourself or that you purchased, and you have different puzzles, uh, scenes and encounters that consist of the player characters talking with different non-player characters, how, how can you actually emulate the complexity of, of the human mind. It's impossible, but with Abraham's method, you create a sort of mm, effective way of deceiving yourself in that you are actually playing with a, a player. And you as a game master and you have player characters coming up with all sorts of ideas, uh, with different topics of conversation to um, interact with non-player characters. So it covers um, social interaction, exploration, and combat as well. Although combat, I think that's the um, easiest problem to take on when you're trying to run things on your own, because you could also use other systems like, for example, Hostile, the AI system for war games. I reviewed that deck of cards a while ago. I'm going to put the link in the description below so you can check it out. It's going to be very useful for you if you're running things solo or, or co-op, even if you're not using Abraham's method, if you're running things using Mythic, that is, uh, as a player character, it could help you determine the different attacks and actions of the enemy forces. But with Abraham's method, we're going to use a, a tool or a set of tools, it depends, that were uh, recommended to me by a couple of viewers a few years back. I don't remember which, uh, the, the viewers, the, the people that recommended this deck of cards to, uh, to me, but uh, I'm really thankful. I actually checked them out and they are great. And as I uh, went back to what I said in my review of the Solitary GM, everything just clicked. It made a lot of sense because with the Solitary Game Master, uh, the game master is supposed to emulate player characters based on uh, six stereotypes or perhaps even archetypes. But you may remember that in that review I mentioned that those archetypes were a bit ambiguous. You basically have the the power gamer or power player or min maxer. You have the uh, kick in the door style of player. You had the uh, tactician and the specialist or ninja that were pretty much uh, there were there was a bit of confusion because a ninja is supposed to be a tactician as well both in fiction and in reality so it didn't make too much sense there's also the storyteller archetype so you had those archetypes but they felt too general in my opinion there were just so many ways in which they could take on different situations in a role-playing game scenario or adventure you, you needed something a bit more specific Mm. And when it comes to puzzles, 
and interacting with uh, social with uh, non-player characters that is those social situations and those situations in which you can perhaps you need to solve a riddle or activate some sort of mechanism it became quite impossible to do so it depends on the complexity of the puzzle and the conversation with a non-player character of course but in situations where there is uh, hidden information it's quite difficult to, to come up with a system to solve that even the solitary game master document uh, told you that something like if you encounter a puzzle uh, just uh, roll to see which archetype or stereotype comes into play oh if you roll tactician then you solve the puzzle and that's it and that's so lackluster so unsatisfying now i'm not blaming the author on the contrary i'm actually praising the author because um, he took the steps in the right direction to emulate player characters but just thinking of all of those uh, complex and difficult to solve puzzles that had more than one way to, to solve them just making a roll to see oh they solve them without getting all of that color all, all of that uh, those vibrant moments where your players suddenly come up with this solution that neither you nor the author thought about and they actually solve that problem or sometimes they fail in a very spectacular way that's a lot of, of fun in my opinion those moments they, they really bring an extra spice or magic to role-playing game sessions so back on point because i deviated a bit from the <laughs> subject i have these uh, tools that are the um, uh, game master apprentice they are uh, decks of cards uh, suited for different uh, styles of play or genres i'm going to put a link in the description below so you can check them out in uh, drive through rpg you can get them as a deck of cards or buy them as a pdf but i actually use them as a pdf and i'm going to tell you how to use any deck of cards without spending money on, on some uh, thick card stock to print them well let's let's talk about how to use them as a pdf first because i think this is going to be very useful even if you do not play role-playing games if you play war games and such sometimes you have these decks in the case of hostile ai you can also use the hostile deck as a pdf without printing it and i'm going to tell you how let's say that you open your uh, pdf of uh, the game master's apprentice and if you click on the left side if you are using Ado um, adobe acrobat reader you can see the pages and they are divided uh, uh, they are numbered you have 20 pages each one of those 20 pages contains six cards so n I, th I think you already know what i'm talking about right you you could roll your d20 set it die to determine the page oh it, i rolled uh five and then you roll a um, six-sided die and it's a six so you go to page five and the sixth the sixth card that's the card that you're going to be using to emulate a player character and if you're using the game master uh, the game master's apprentice as a solo tool uh, to for you to play as a player character like mythic that's actually the main purpose of the game master's apprentice it's just that i used it the other way around because each of these cards, and you can check them out in the um, in Drive Through RPG, you can uh, you can click on the cover. I think it's they show you the card on the cover, or in the um, that way where you can preview the the product. You can see the cards that they have all sorts of elements to come up with some random things. You have a verb, uh, an adjective, a subject. You have different odds of yes and no. You have different uh, dice results, runes, different sounds, sites, belongings that you can find, names, catalysts, virtues, vices, locations, etc. You have so many things. So I actually use these cards with Abraham's method to emulate the reactions or the interactions and actions specifically of player characters, of um, AI controlled player characters. I'm going to tell you how to do it and I also plan to release uh, a session because I, I play tested this many times but um, I didn't take uh, too many notes or organize them in a sort of palatable way to create a, a video for them but my uh, more most recent uh, playtesting session I did take detailed notes so I plan to release a video or if I have the time several videos 
showing you uh, how you run a, a campaign setting on the uh, using a white box DND system. And so to emulate player characters in your game, you only need to pay attention to the verb, the adjective, and the subject. And I also recommend, I actually re recommend that, that you roll for your results instead of printing the cards and drawing them because it takes less time. If you are go going to be constantly shuffling, that takes quite a bit of time because these cards, although they have different uh, group results, if you want more variety, it's better to draw several cards. So, so let's say that you want to draw a different combination of verb and adjective and subject. So you, you would draw one card. Oh, that's a verb. You would draw, you would have to shuffle the deck and you would have to draw another card. Oh, that's the adjective. And then you have to shuffle it again. And now you draw the uh, subject. So that takes a lot of time. And you, with just a few rolls, or even if you don't like rolling, you could basically just scroll up and down and pick a card randomly. You could easily generate a different, um, a different result based on the verb, the adjective, and the subject. So it's easier for you to uh, end up with the same card twice because maybe you want a result that could contain a verb and a subject from the same card. That's an easy way to do it. So onto the examples. Let's say that you are running your adventure. You purchased your adventure module for from Drive Through RPG or whatever, and the player characters start with a situation of social interaction. They arrive to this tavern, and at the moment, things are the place is quite deserted. And there are only three player characters, sorry, three non-player characters there. There is the, um, there is a, a moody or pessimistic merchant. There is a um, um, joyous or happy barbarian, female barbarian warrior. And there is a bartender that is quite superstitious and likes to talk about legends and myths. So you could be asking yourself, which of these non-player characters are the player characters going to talk to? It's also handy to determine the personalities of the player characters or the single player character if you're using, using just one before starting the game so that you can use that personality to or mental state or emotional state or whatever to make sense of some things depending on the results that you get. But it's not always necessary. Either way, I'm going to put a tool in the description below of a generator to uh, come up with some simple character concepts. So maybe you make your roll and I'm just going to simulate like, oh, I rolled my d20 and my six and I do this three times. So maybe I get uh, clarify, frightful, superstition. So in that case, I think they will, the party of adventurers would be talking to the bartender or the barkeep because, like I told you, he's quite superstitious and uh, superstitious, sorry, and likes to talk about legends. So those key words, that ad adjective, that verb and that subject have to do with that. Maybe they want to find out more about the local superstitions or uh, maybe something related to the adventure. You're going to be generating everything like that by making your rolls and checking out the card results. But what if you rolled a different result? Maybe you make your roll and you check the cards and you obtain discuss feral deity. So maybe you think that the female barbarian knows about this uh, feral deity. So the player characters want to talk to her that there is this deity that it's quite savage and they know very little about it. it it's all uh, related to the adventurer campaign that you are running. You have to take into consideration uh, the way the adventure is going, normally going to proceed when you play it with uh, real people. So let's say that they approach the barbarian and start talking to, to her and she likes to joke around, etc. That's the personality that is described in the adventure module 
or perhaps you designed this adventure module and you came up with the, her personality. However, what the player characters do not know is that she's actually a member of an evil cult. Perhaps that feral deity is a sort of antagonist in the campaign or adventure, and she's actually a cultist. So maybe you think, well, maybe the player characters can discover this somehow when they are talking with her. So you make your rolls again, you roll your d20 and your d6, and let's see, you obtain allow cautious belief. So maybe the characters are quite cautious uh, uh, about the uh, uh, belief system in this deity and they start to talk to the barbarian woman and she also, she, it, it just looks like she knows too much about this strange deity. So maybe now you need, you need to make your role, perhaps a sense motive check or use some other type of, of skill or knowledge check to see if the player characters can uh, figure out that she's actually uh, perhaps delivering too much information, some, uh, some information that only a member of that cult would be private to or knowledgeable about. So that way you can have some really complex social interactions, seeing what the player characters talk about with the different non-player characters. Maybe they decided to talk to the merchant. You got another, another result that took you to the merchant. So what are they going to talk about with the uh, merchant? You make your roll and you check out, um, you get prevent impressive technology. So maybe it's related to something in the quest. Maybe the merchant wants to get his hands or wants to stop a rival merchant from getting his hands on some technology that he will use to, to sell some goods. There's perhaps some sort of device or some other type of weapon and he wants to hire the player characters to stop that uh, rival merchant from doing so. So the possibilities are endless. If you are playing an intrigue based system or something related with diplomacy, seduction, it's just so easy to generate so many conversations and if the module tells you that you need to proceed this way or that way, all of these random results could be related to uh, those interactions. So for example, let's say that you're playing Ars Magica and a messenger arrived with some information about a place that um, the characters could be interested in exploring because it contains some scrolls or some sort of magical artifact, etc. But that um, non-player character, that messenger is actually holding back some information. So you once again you make your rolls and what are the player characters going to ask uh, to this uh, non-player character? So you get uh, decimate, mm, uh, malevolent, salvation. So maybe it's something related to the church. Maybe they, uh, after making some rolls, to to sense that the non-player, the non-messenger or non-player character is withholding information they uh, tell him something like hey, you need to tell us this information because otherwise the church because the church is uh, quite the powerful antagonistic force in Ars Magica the church could uh, tell you that uh, accuse you of not seeking salvation because you kept this information from us and we can actually work with them or work against them it all depends on the plot and that's how the player characters are going to obtain this information so it's somewhat difficult to come up with these um, examples when they don't have uh, um, a scenario to to choose the different answers, but I should have opened one before uh, <laughs> doing this video, but you pretty much get the idea, right? Let's see what other situation could arise. Mm. Maybe the player characters are looking for a specific object and they have no idea that that non-player character that they are going to talk to knows the location or, or actually owns that object that they are searching for. So you make your role to see if the in during the conversation the non-player character tells them something about this and you get a plan, opportune um, vehicle. Maybe they are looking for some sort of um, key to some sort of strange science fantasy vehicle. There is this sort of uh, motorcycle or tank or whatever in a science fantasy setting, but it can only be activated by using a special key. And suddenly he mentions that he has this strange key and he doesn't know uh, what it's for, that it seems like it has some sort of vehicle drawn on it. 
and all the player characters can ask him for that key. So uh, even the complexity of social interactions can be solved with this, uh, with Abraham's method. But if you have any sort of situation or social interactions that you have seen that you think it's not possible to, to solve it or handle it in an effective way with this method, uh, please let me know in the comment section. Uh, ask me your question because I've played, the, I've used this so many times. I'm sure I can um, give you a satisfactory or if not somewhat satisfactory way on how to use these cards for that. Now let's talk about the puzzles, uh, exploration, interaction with the environment, perhaps in a dungeon, because all of those puzzles that you have to perhaps give an answer to a, ri a riddle or you need to activate some sort of device or avoid some trap, especially when it comes to old school dungeons, it's very difficult to just figure out a way to, to emulate the response or reaction of a fictional or a AI control non-player character, oh, sorry, uh, player character. <laughs> so maybe the players, the player characters are moving through this mega dungeon, a funhouse style of mega dungeon, and they enter this room. This room is quite strange. There is only a metallic door at the end, it's locked. And there's also uh, this block at the middle. It's a huge block and the only things on this on the block is a sort of decoration on each of its sides uh, you see this image of a man that instead of arms has wings and he's flying above what appears to be rays of of light like sunlight sunlight rays another curious thing about this room is that the walls are partly covered in this chessboard sort of pattern with black and white squares they actually reach up to two meters high and strangely enough that's also the height of the block in the center of the room and suddenly the room closes behind the player characters they have activated some sort of trap and they start to hear this tick tock tick tock tick tock and as time goes by the uh, tick tock becomes faster and faster tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock so something is going to happen Will they figure out the way to solve this, uh, to avoid this trap? Because the thing is that the block is actually giving you a clue that you need to either fly or, or be on top of that uh, chess board or checkers board sort of pattern because from the white squares, beams of searing uh, light are going to be projected and they will burn anyone who is at their same level. So the player characters would either need to use some sort of levitation spell or item or climb up on top of the block that is just above that pattern of um, ray producing squares to save themselves from getting hit by those hit rays. So you make your rolls to see if the party of adventurers figure, can figure this out and you get hide widespread mystery so it's just too much of a mystery for them they cannot solve the puzzle and maybe you are a benevolent game master and just at the moment when the trap is going to activate let's say that you tell your imaginary players you tell them well now the tick tocking is just too fast tick -tock, tick -tock, something's going to happen so you give each player character a chance to do something maybe you have the typical party of uh, warrior, thief, and cleric, and wizard. So maybe you roll to see what the fighter does. You make your roll, and you obtain curse, unfair, nightmare. So maybe the fighter just despairs. He's just cursing this nightmare situation. He thinks he's going to die because there's going to be some sort of, of trap that is going to kill him, and he does nothing. And you make your roll to see what the thief of the group does and you obtain um, strengthen aggressive foreigner so maybe he's um, so so angry that he starts to just beat or attack the block at the center trying to see if he can do some damage to it or attack the squares on the walls he's actually quite desperate he, maybe he failed his role to disarm the trap 
and he just went nuts as well. But maybe you make a roll for the spellcasters, and you obtain um, halt, uh, repulsive, container. If those spellcasters, the wizard or the cleric, has some sort of spell to stop some force effect or magical attack from happening, they could perhaps use it and you should allow it so that they actually stop those rays. You could also make some rolls to determine how many player characters they manage to protect or just themselves. You have a system of odds of getting a yes or no with these cards too. But let's say that the fighter became a bit more, acted a bit more intelligent. So maybe you obtained, well, I can't, I don't see the exact results here, but maybe, oh, okay, well, let's say that you have, you obtained trap and you obtain something else like resist and tool or trap resistant tool or something. Maybe that fighter raises his magical shield and he's going to just step a bit closer to the block in the middle of the room and he's going to protect himself from whatever is going to happen he doesn't know what's going to happen if there's going to be like a poisoned needle or some enemies are going to be summoned into the room so he just stands there to meet the onslaught with his shield and so you could give him perhaps a bonus or reduce the damage that he's going to suffer and in the case of the thief maybe the thief obtains something like let's say a void a void impending doom or wreckage so maybe the rogue is actually going to try to to roll the uh, duck and roll or <laughs> or try to hide in a corner of the room and you could actually give that rogue a bonus to his saving throw when the white squares on the room are going to project those hit beams that are going to potentially harm or even kill all of the, all of the player characters but like i said there could have been many possibilities maybe you obtain something that said something like climb climb occult object so maybe they actually figure out things and they climb on top of the block in the middle of the room so this could be applied to any sort of puzzle even if they find the typical sphinx giving asking the characters the correct answer to a riddle maybe the answer is apples or whatever let's say that the answer is apples can they actually solve this so you make your roll and you obtain succeed famous council so maybe they actually solved this riddle because they talked to they obtained counsel from someone that was knowledgeable about riddles many years ago and this riddle is actually quite famous in a particular riddle so they come up with the answer that is apples so as you can see you do need some interpretation go with whatever occurs to you immediately do not try to manipulate the results in favor or against the player characters so you can obtain a certain degree of fairness now when it comes to combat you can also use these cards to determine what the non the player characters sorry are going to do so you have your typical party again so what does the fighter, uh, maybe they encounter this group of gnolls, what is the fighter going to do? And you make your roll and it says, defeat, defiant, oh, let's try a different result, uh, defeat, treacherous, game. So maybe he thinks that the gnolls uh, uh, are underestimating the party, that this is just a game for them, and this is a very straightforward response, he just wants to fight them, he probably charges at the closest null and tries to defeat that null but what did the fighter obtain something else maybe he obtained allow maniacal weapon maybe he is going to use a maniacal laughter as his weapon to intimidate the nulls you make your roll as to see if your intimidation check succeeds so that they get a penalty when they first attack and what is the rogue or thief going to do you make your roll and maybe it says something like heal benevolent sorry benevolent purity 
So that I would interpret it as if that rogue is going to focus on protecting the cleric, the one who is pure and benevolent. So the rogue is going to stick close to the cleric. What is the wizard going to do? So you make your rolls and you get find ironic lies. So that's interesting. Maybe the wizard is going to use a spell to see if there is some sort of illusion. Maybe he thinks that the gnolls are an illusion or that they are protective, sorry, protected by some magical effect. Maybe it's not the correct choice, but that happens with players in real life. Sometimes your players come up with some ideas that are unnecessary. It's just a simple encounter, but they think they uh, read too deep into it. And they think, oh, those are not gnolls, they're actually an illusion. And they spend their illusion spell and they waste it. They, sorry, their spell to something like true seeing or seeing through the illusion. And they waste that spell because there was no illusion. And what is the cleric going to do? Maybe you obtain replace um, aberrant salvation. Well, let's go with something else. Replace aberrant lookout maybe the player the cleric has some sort of summoning spell of a, some sort of extra planner uh, vigilant being or, or uh, being that oversees things or anything like that he could summon that being or maybe he obtains something else maybe he obtains delay brazen um, murder maybe he's going to cast some sort of spell maybe it's not a cleric uh, but a druid He's going to summon some binds or something from the environment to slow down or immobilize the gnolls. So you can also obtain some uh, ways on how to handle combat with these cards. Mm. Or if not, you could use the hostile AI system that I told you that. And remember to check out the link in the description below to handle combat because with that, those cards, you also have things like uh, patrol, sweep, charge, move defensively, things like that. But I actually, for role-playing games, because they are more open when it comes to using so many skills and powers, etc., I would prefer to use this uh, deck of the uh, Game Master Apprentice to handle role-playing game battles rather than hostile. Hostile is more for war games. So there's just so many ways in which player characters in a normal RPG session, they come up with some creative things to defeat their enemies using different tools and skills. So those are the ways that you can play. You can run any adventure module. Like I told you, I have play tested this quite a bit. I uh, let's see if next week, probably next week or the next, I can release a complete session report. It doesn't go too far into details, but I managed to uh, take note of the different random results that I obtained and I will tell you how I interpret those results to run a white box style of adventure, a very dangerous and lethal one. Mm. It's also important to note that each of these, uh, the Game Master ad Apprentice decks are, like I told you, that you have the horror deck, the sci-fi deck, so you can use each of those decks to cover any situation. There's also the basic deck Although that one is not numbered um, by 20, like I told you, each page has a number and you get 20 pages immediately when you click on the left of the document. In that case, you will have to count them manually or print them perhaps, and just print them in a few pages and you make your roll and you have already, uh, those. you have numbered those pages, perhaps double-sided. So you have 10 pages with one, uh, 10 sheets of paper with one page printed on each side you could still make your rolls but i really recommend that you use a specific deck with a theme that matches your adventure there are no for example superhero decks but sci-fi applies to superheroes quite well in my opinion many elements of sci-fi also apply to many different adventures related to sub superheroes or you if you are running a wild west game you could use um the basic deck perhaps it depends, maybe you're running a, a horror Wild West adventure or something like that. You could use a horror deck instead. The Wild West theme um, is quite intuitive to apply it to different results of the cards. So that's basically Abraham's method. 
I hope you will um, obtain uh, good things using this method, uh, run all of those adventures and role-playing games that your players uh, were not interested in running. It, it happens to me all the time. You really uh, get a bit frustrated when you uh, have these adventures and systems and your players are not into those things. And also if so, uh, you don't have a group that's also self-explanatory, you can also use this to perhaps your to keep your uh, game master skills uh, sharp because you're playing this you're using this method to play as a game master against this ai controlled player characters but again if you have any questions about how this method works maybe i, I wasn't too clear with how you you can use this method just ask me in the comments i'll try to give you the best answer that i can in future videos i also want to tell you how i used abraham's method to play uh, board games because there are some board games that mm, have some different some very difficult things to apply when you are playing them sorry playing them solo some things related to hidden information as well it won't be able to i won't sorry the method will not be able to uh, cover some very complex board games perhaps but I will try to do my best and telling you how to use this this system, this method with that. And when it comes to war games, you could also use them like that. But I think Hostile does a pretty good job with most board games. I'm sorry, war games. So yeah, definitely give Abraham's method a chance. At first I was using Mythic with this. I combined Mythic, the Game Master emulator, with these cards. But I decided to, in during the... Uh, last month of playtesting decided to put mythic to the side when it comes to uh, player character emulation but don't get me wrong mythic is still probably the best system when it comes to having a structure in running a solo experience but with you participating as a player character but if you are playing as a um, as, as a game master and you want to simulate those player characters coming up with all sorts of uh, crazy solutions to different things I highly recommend that you use Abraham's method with uh, this deck of cards or maybe you have your own way to randomize uh, a verb, an adjective and a subject. Definitely uh, try it. I think you will find some really awesome results. And stay tuned because like I said, let's see if I am in a week or two, I can release a video with a complete session of how things go because I still have a lot of reviews. Uh, on the QE on that I want to to bring out as soon as possible. Well, uh, thanks for watching this uh, video. If you have any comments or questions, like I said, please let me know. And thank you so much to those that have been supporting the channel with Drive Through RPG Gift Certificates. If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you, and see you later.